Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from the this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Cope. This is Mitchell. I'm Krista This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Eric Burgess, also known as Bergie, and you're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. Eric Burgess was a freestyle aerialist who won Olympic gold in Nagano in 98, was the world champion in 99, and captured the World Cup in 01 and 02, and has been deservedly inducted into the U.S. Skiing Hall of Fame. His event required him to shoot down a slope at 50 miles an hour, hit a 70-degree ramp, and threw him six stories into the air so he could flip and twist for our amazement. He is bananas, and he's on the Break It Down show. And, Bergy, we are elated to have you on. Thanks, man. Yeah, good to be here. What are you up to nowadays? Oh, boy, uh, a lot of different things for the U.S. ski team. Normally, I help with uh, recruitment and development of their D team. This year, as the Olympics got closer, starting uh, last summer, I started helping the Olympic team more, which was fun because those were the same kids that I coached about seven years ago when they were 15 years old. Um, I hadn't seen them for a few years, and it was fun to get back and and see how they were doing and try to prepare them for the Olympics. So I do a little bit of coaching on the hill for the development team, and then with the the Olympic team, I mostly uh, advise their current coaches. So if we can just capture a little piece of what it's like to have a life that leads to Olympic glory, uh, because you've seen these kids when they were kids and now you're seeing them as Olympians and training them for the experience. Let's go back to your experience. At what point do you identify as somebody who's an Olympic hopeful? You know, when I started the sport and when I was 15, I saw it on TV and uh, there wasn't really any place for me to do it around here in Missoula, Montana. So I had to wait a few years to get to a water ramp facility. And that's a a uh, wooden jump with a plastic artificial snow surface on it that we used to uh, jump into a swimming pool. And uh, I did that for a few years. And I, you know, I started, that was, I didn't get out there till I was about 19. And it took uh, almost 10 years before I made my first Olympic team. And I wasn't really an Olympic hopeful until a couple years before that. So, you know, there's, there's lots of people vying for those spots. There's lots of, uh, hopefuls out there or people that think they're hopefuls or that think they're they're close but a lot of things can happen along the way and uh, you never know who's gonna who's gonna make it so it really comes down to the last uh, month or two before the games before we even really know who's gonna make the team it's great to get that perspective for those of us who are outside of the sport though you're talking about the Olympic team being established really down to the wire. Yeah. Still, we're talking about a finite population of individuals who dedicate themselves to the craft, who are available for selection, and yeah, whose development yeah. is so far up the chain of athleticism that you pretty much all know each other from the point that you are just beginning to train. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's a pretty small sport. It takes a unique individual to see it and say, you know, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, I want to do it. And that's for me, right? <laughs> right, yeah. And, it, you know, a lot a lot of times guys are more drawn to it than girls are. So we have plenty of guys in the sport who, you know, they see it. They look, they say, wow, that looks, that looks insane. I want to do that. Girls are a little more cautious. So, uh, you know, that's where our recruiting comes in and we recruit gymnasts uh both both men and women but yeah it's a it's a small group of people and you know we've spent since 2010 when i started working for the team we spent a lot of time on recruiting and getting more kids into the sport just exposing people to the sport to to grow the numbers and so this year was really tough picking the olympics team we didn't pick it until just about just a couple weeks ago, and we have we're leaving home a couple of, at least you know a few great athletes, and that's wow. insane. But it's good we have we have more numbers now. We have six spots, so we have six aerialists going to the Olympics, and we have a good shot at getting a couple medals. 
so for the aerialists in particular, the ability to have some or actually some gymnastic experience is really kind of crucial, right? Yeah, we are skiers, you know. Traditionally, we came from skiing, the, uh, mm-hmm. the hot dog skiers of the 70s. A lot of those guys were gymnasts, guys and right. girls. But, um, you know, there's different strategies. Some countries really focus on recruiting only gymnasts, and then they teach them to ski. We see some problems with that. You, you need to be a skier as well. Uh, the gymnasts that, that get recruited and, and join the sport at a late age, they don't have the same muscles and ligaments that are strengthened in skiing so they end up getting little you know nagging injuries to their shins and calves and so we we really prefer to have um, gymnasts who have skied for a long time we don't really like to recruit gymnasts who have never skied before although we we have done that so there's it's still up in the air to trying to decide the right balance but anytime we can find somebody who has three or four or five or more years of, of gymnastics and skiing together, that's the ideal candidate. So as you're sorting through these guys, let's back up and talk about what it does take to get there. I mean, you say it takes a special person. You know, here's the first question I want to ask you. When you look at some event or some sporting activity, and you're like, Jesus, that's crazy. I would never do that. What's that thing? Because a quad quad <laughs> is insane. Like it's yeah. we can't even see and count the twists and flips that elite guys do. So you're down to do that. What are you not down to do? <laughs> you know, uh, that's a good example for me is um, base jumping and skydiving. I I've always wanted to skydive. I tried to go when I was 15. They told me I had to be 16 to do it. So I went on my 16th birthday. And back then, you just did a static line, which is having the parachute pulled out. As soon as you leave the plane, it automatically pulls, and then you have to take a bunch of classes before you can skydive. But I decided, you know, I looked into it, and I heard uh, both with base jumping and skydiving, especially base jumping, I really, really want to base jump. And if I didn't have a daughter, I probably would. But I've heard, you know, the best athletes in the world, the best base jumpers in the world die doing that sport. Uh, it's not always in their control. It's more a matter of odds. And so that's something that I've chosen not to do that I would love to do just because there's not enough control in it. It's some things are too dangerous, you know, and we've never had any, uh, paralyzing injuries or anything like that in our sport. We, we take a lot of care and spend a lot of time making sure that the landing hill is soft and it's steep and the jumps are the same every time. We have a radar gun that checks our speed, and uh, we do the jump hundreds and hundreds of times on water before we ever do it on snow. This is one of the things. So I, uh, I knew the Mosley brothers, uh, you know, right as you guys were all emerging onto the scene, and, and they were doing these things. And I knew about you even back then, not just because my aunt was your, your parents' neighbor, but also because you were one of the guys who was out there jumping with these guys. And there's just a timeline that you have to line, you have to stay healthy, you have to have, you know, the, the skiing pedigree and the gymnastics stuff. But before you can throw a triple twisting, triple flipping jump, you know, you, you have to have done it hundreds of times. And that's why it takes all this time to get there. And I, I don't think, you know, in our minds, like you just go out and you start a new trick and you start hucking and, you know, yeah. next thing you know, you're on the snow. Yeah, you know, a lot of people look at our sport or look at us like kind of daredevils where you just decide I'm going to do it and you start driving the motorcycle down the ramp and you go for it. It's so much more complicated than that. It takes so much thought and attention to detail and perfectionism to be able to hit a good takeoff. You know, we're going over 70 kilometers an hour into a jump that's 14 feet tall, 70 degrees at the top. It rises to 70 degrees and rises up 14 feet in less than 20 feet. So it's very steep. We have to maintain a perpendicular body to ski angle on the way up the jump. And then after takeoff, based on how fast we were going on the in run and how much we were leaning back or leaning forward, we have to start making adjustments in order to make sure we do three flips, not three and a half uh, before we land on the snow. So there's a lot of a thought um, that just goes into controlling the how fast we're flipping in order to hit the, hit the landing hill at the right angle. And at the same time, we're also doing up to quadruple and quintuple twists. So we do those, we initiate those twists and speed up and slow down those twists in different ways, depending on 
how fast we're flipping. If we're flipping too fast or we're too high in the air, we initiate those twists using arms that are up, up high for the most part. And if we're slow or too far forward on takeoff, we'll have our arms low. And it's, it's important that it's instinctive because there's a lot of other things to think about. Usually we're trying to break bad habits of like leaning to the left or something or looking at the wrong spot on the landing hill. So it's important to make those things instinctive. And to do that, we, we do a ton of numbers on water five days a week, two to three hours a day. That is tremendous. And for us to understand, for the layperson to realize just the reps that you guys do to perfect those skills and the finite nature of those skills is just remarkable. I'd like to shift gears, though, and talk about the experience of being an Olympian, because one of the things that I think is attractive about your sport in particular, aerial freestyle, is that we look to the team for a measure of rugged adventure and just a measure of cool. I mean, one of the things that we like about the sport is that it's cool and it's populated with guys <laughs> and girls who are cool. So not to disparage the guys who are curling, but not as cool. <laughs> so so yeah, what's it like know. to be not only on that campus, but to be the big man on the campus? It's it's a little surreal. It's a like uh, you know, it's like you're watch. It's it's looks just like it does on TV. There's all the flags and all the athletes and stuff, but you're standing there, looking around at the friends next to you, going, "This is I'm on TV. I'm I'm in the Olympic experience. This is this is happening." So it's a little surreal. Uh, and as far as the uh, the cool factor goes, I would agree that aerialists are cool <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> We're, we're pretty, we're pretty calm and pretty down to earth and pretty mellow because we get scared. We get challenged. We get beat up. You know, it's kind of like, I think of it, it's, it's, it's not nearly as bad, but I think of it like in world war one, when they were in the trenches and they get the order to jump out of the trench and rush the enemy, they're all scared. They don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the future is uncertain, and they're doing it anyway. And a lot of times, not, you know, once in a while, once a year or so, we get some bad weather, and we don't know where to start on the in run. We don't know if we're going to hit the jump at the right speed or not. But we know it's going to be close enough to be okay, but it still doesn't feel right. And there's a lot of stress. There's fear. And um, it's extremely challenging. It's extremely intimidating. The view from the top of the jumps is scary, to say the least. You look at the kicker, it looks like a wall that you're skiing into, and you see the guy before you launch 50 feet in the air. And uh, it's extremely intimidating. So when you get through that day, at the end of the day, we're relaxed and we're cool and everything else is easy and nothing else is scary. And it's because we've been we've been challenged and we've come through. You know, I was going to make the comparison, but you did it first, and that's cool. I like that you did it. I'm a combat guy, and when I look at life in general, I get to say, hey, no one's shooting at me today. Yeah. You know, what I'm going to do, whatever crazy – like, I know what crazy is. I know what that feels like, and so there is a calm that I have. Right. And if I lose that center, I can reorient quickly and go, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> it's, it's the same, same thing if, I'm, if I've got to give a speech or if I want to do anything that, that might be embarrassing or challenging for most people. I just think of it like this is nothing. This is nothing compared to, compared to what I have done in the past. And a lot of things are like that. A lot of things seem easy in a way once you challenge yourself and push yourself to achieve some unbelievable things. Listeners, go to airbergy.com. Uh, that's A I R B E R G Y.com, where you can see uh, the dry suits uh, that Bergy's selling. And they're for a mixture of all water sports. And uh, there's biographical information on there, too. And there's a lot of places you can read about the achievements that we're talking about today with Eric Burgess. At some point, you know, five flips, five twists, we've the amplitude stops without making, you know, a faster entrance, bigger ramp, and you're just, you know, perpetually flipping and twisting. Where does the sport go? What, what, is, what is the greatest jump that's five years ahead of us? We've sort of reached the limits of what our jump design can handle. One idea 
would be to raise the landing hill. Right now we uh, we go up about 20 feet and then we fall over 45 feet. Um, I someday we could take more speed into a bigger jump and go up uh, 30 or 40 feet and only fall, you know, 20 or 30 feet. And but that would take uh, that would take a major investment and that that's a that's a really big deal. So we might end up evolving slowly towards that type of facility. But right now, where we're going is, um, you know, we used to, when I started, there was only one guy, I think, in the world that did a triple flip with four twists. As my career went on over almost 20 years, we got to where, you know, there was six or seven or eight guys doing quadruple twists. And then near the end, there was one guy doing five twists. Well, now this year, it's, it's just become apparent in the last couple of months that there's going to be more guys than ever by a lot doing five twists and doing them well. So we're doing five twists. We continue to get more and more flips and twists, mostly twists. And I guess, you know, I think we'll, we'll do six twists. Maybe one person will do six twists in the next games four years from now. But as far as adding a flip goes to do quadruple flips, it's pretty hard on the body and it would require changing the facilities. So we're looking for more twists and more perfection and more athletes doing those hardest tricks. Getting back to the Olympic experience, I think the best example for me is in 1994. That was my first Olympics. I was 24 and it was in Little Hammer, Norway. My dad was there and my mom and my sister and my dad went and found our great, great, great grandfather's farm in Little Hummer and it had the Burgess name on it and everything. And that that was super cool for him and for him to hear all the Norwegian guys talking on, on at the fires burning in, in the city and to see, you know, the people there dragging their kids around on sleds in furs like they had like nothing had changed in hundreds of years. And it was kind of like Disneyland's version of the Olympics. It was a winter wonderland. They had brand new snow. Everything was covered in snow. Everything was old fashioned. And it couldn't have been any more picturesque for me. It was the ideal Olympic experience. And, and like I said, you know, you, you, you walk in, you're looking around and you're thinking, this is like, this is like what I see on TV, but I'm, I'm here. I'm actually I'm, I'm one of them, you know, and it's kind of hard to believe and it, it's weird, but it's definitely special. And I took a lot of pictures and have a lot of memories from the four Olympics that I went to. Your venture it coincides a lot with Johnny's venture. You know, he, you guys both won gold in Nagano. Johnny Mosley's our show today. We just put him up. We're going to put you up on Monday. Right. But the, uh, the 98 Olympics sort of marked a change in the freestyles place. Uh, I remember when he won, I was... I was a mass comm student in college and I'm, you know, I knew Johnny. So I was like, Hey, you're going to win a gold medal. What you're doing is different. Let me do a story on you. So I did this little bio piece on him. CBS had never done that. And I don't recall them doing one for you. And yet I, I knew that you were a favorite to go out there and, and compete hard, especially leading into the Olympics immediately. What changed about that? Cause now we have slope style and half pipe and all these different events where people are doing huge amplitude moves what what changed how can you describe what it was like in Lillehammer compared to where it is now well going back a little further before Lillehammer we were trying to become an Olympic event in 88 uh, which you know I happened to drive up there with my brothers and I and slept in a field behind the jumps and that was that was a unique experience and fun um, but in in 88 in 1988 in Calgary, we tried to we were trying to be a full medal sport, but they would just uh, awarded us uh, demonstration status. And our sport was seen as too crazy, too extreme, too wild. And I remember all through late 80s, early 90s, when we were trying to get a full medal status awarded to us by the International Olympic Committee, our theme was we're not crazy. It's not dangerous. We are serious athletes, and we try to portray that image in order to be accepted. And there was either alpine skiing, racing, or there was us. If you wanted to do something different and a little off the wall, you did you did aerials or moguls. There's also Nordic jumping, you know, and cross country. Those were a little less popular. But there was basically two choices. You can race or you can be one of those crazy guys in freestyle skiing. And right about the time that we got our 
theme or our image dialed in to be, you know, more conservative and wearing the same kind of clothes that the racers wore with the same sponsors and even, you know, having racing written, written on our gloves. And um, right about the time we got that persona dialed in, society wanted something else. They wanted uh, extreme. They wanted wild. They wanted crazy. They wanted exactly what we were. And we should have, you know, kind of maybe been more true to ourselves in the late 80s and early 90s and just waited for the rest of society to come around. But it worked out all right. We got we became an Olympic sport. That was huge. And that was even before snowboarding. And then snowboarding came along and the X Games and slope style and, and half pipe and stuff. And that just gave athletes another place to go, another option. And any athletes that wanted to do something crazy or extreme, they tended to go to those sports. And our sport then ended up being seen as more traditional and conservative and not something that the games would uh, incorporate. So it's funny how the, the images have changed and, um, you know, the just allowing more, there's like, you know, between snowboarding and free skiing, there's like six or eight more sports now that, that kids can do that allowed, that gave them more choices, which meant less of them came to our sport. And the same was true for sponsors and for ski areas. You know, if they're looking for something new, they're looking to those sports. So those sports really took off and grew very fast and they're huge. The biggest reason though is probably not necessarily people looking for something new or looking for something extreme, but it's more the biggest reason that 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 they grow so grew so fast and are so huge now is because anybody in any skiing state can go to any ski area and do those uh, smaller versions of those, but they have terrain parks and they have half pipes. Um, our sport requires very unique facilities and, and it didn't used to, but in order to do quadruple flips with four twists or triple flips with quintuple twists, in order to do that, our facilities have had to evolve to a level of perfection that very few facilities in the country can meet. So we've become kind of a niche market and a small group of people but it really it just takes some exposure it really just takes some coaches going to trampoline nationals for example and telling them about our sport and how to get in it in order to grow the sport and we've started to do that since 2010 and it's working great it's grown it's probably four times bigger so it is it will grow and it does grow it is big but it takes it doesn't do it on its own it takes some effort it's great to hear that the effort is working because it's a fun sport to watch. And you're right. The unique environment does sort of narrow things down. But the other thing that you guys have going uh, in the sport are personalities that we can look at. And, you know, let's face it, you guys are bananas, but you're right. Society has shifted to where we like that, but still in a way where you're still corporate friendly in that guys who are older and further along in their careers can listen to a motivational speaker and identify a little bit with the fact that, hey, uh, you know, I think things are tough when I'm taking phone calls I don't like. And then here comes this guy who came to talk to us at our uh, at our corporate retreat and his life is crazy. So suddenly I, I can dial mine back and go, oh, it's all right. I can I can show up tomorrow and I'll be fine and I'll be motivated to perform. So I want to go back, though, to the idea of going to the Olympics and what it's like to feel that sensation that hey we're here and it's us and we're doing it because the other thing that i think humanizes that experience for you guys is like you said it's a small community of athletes so you have the you know the factor that you're thrust on the world stage but you still are with five other guys on the team who you you know and and there's some level of comfort in that but then there's the social experience of being in the olympics Aside from going down the jump, being in the Olympic Village with the 100 most elite athletes in the world, what's that experience like? When you're a young athlete in your 20s, you're always looking at other people. And it's cool. It, it is really cool, especially when you see people that are, that are famous. You know, you know, I think uh, Herschel Walker was in one of the games um, pushing a bobsled. You know, he's a, he's a football player. And. I had heard of him, and I, th I thought that was really cool that he was there. He pushed the bobsled that year. I think so. I saw that him. That is cool. Yeah, I'm not sure which year it was, but there, there's always some famous people around, and 
I was. It's I a was gathering born. of the best human specimens in not just your sport, but in sport. Yeah, you and know, so and it's I, gonna I was, attract others. Yeah, and I, I was comparing them to myself and thinking they hadn't done yeah. any, anything. You know, there there's a bunch of amazing athletes, and they're like, this guy's famous, and he's not any stronger or better than I am. I've spent just as much time in the gym. I've spent just as much time perfecting my skills, and I have just as much or a better chance to win than he does. That's not maybe a very humble thing to think, but that that was fun to think, you know, I made it and uh, there's nobody here that's any better off or better prepared than I am. So not only am I at the Olympics, but I was smart enough to try to make every day and every minute count for the last 10 years leading up to it to uh, have me as prepared or more prepared than all these other amazing athletes, which was, it was a proud moment. And it felt also like I didn't waste my time. Like I made the right decision or the right decisions, uh, those 10 years when I chose to go to the gym instead of doing something else. Yeah. Let me take the pressure even further off you on that. Uh, cause Dave Stewart said this best. So I'll just quote him when Ricky Henderson stole, you know, that, that record breaking base, he said, I am the greatest. And he got some heat for bragging. And Dave Stewart said, there's nothing wrong with bragging on the truth. You know, you had earned it. You had spent 10 years of not doing what exactly you wanted to do, but what you had to do. And you get to sit back and and appreciate that. And that's a cool thing to be able to do. One of the reasons I like to acknowledge it is because I don't consider myself to be uh, exceptionally talented. I don't even know how talented I am, but I'm a normal person. I've got nothing special. And I want the the young athletes that I coach, they know me well enough to know. I make mistakes. I'm human. And I want them to know that this average normal guy made it to a place where he was more prepared than anybody in the world to win a gold medal. And so you can too. And that's why I, that's why I don't mind t- talking about how, how prepared I was or how I, how I compared to other athletes. And your guys' sport has a short peak too. People don't typically repeat as champions. You do have a 10-year run and maybe you have one shot at it. Yeah. And so it's all right again to, to celebrate that. I wanted to ask you about in your guys' sport because it is so there's so much form and protocol to be able to do, you know, five spins and four flips, you know, whatever that is. You don't just show up that day and, and throw that trick out there. Everybody knows that you're working up to this point. Um, So precision is really, really important. But there's also that, um, well, you know, a good example in the 98 Olympics was Johnny taking his jump, that 360 mute grab and saying, let's see anybody do this. Or Peekaboo Street running that loose line in the Super G. And, you know, the announcers are like, this is kind of not running the, the, the line that the Europeans were doing, the technical line. But she was fastest down the mountain because she had the right line for whatever reason that day. What's, what's the uh, balance between precision and looseness in your guys' sport? Uh, the hardest thing to achieve. <laughs> <laughs> the balance. Yeah, it's all about the balance. I was in 98, the 98 Olympics where I won. Uh, I had a flashback to the year before in 1997 when I was competing at my first world championships I had broken my collarbone into six pieces five weeks before that. And I, at World Championships in 97, was just a little bit conservative. And I ended up finishing second. And I hated that. That didn't feel good. So close to being world champion, but not making it. And so I had a flashback to that uh, just before my first jump in 98. And I thought to myself, I am not getting second today. So I took a little bit more speed. I was a little bit more aggressive on takeoff. And I found the edge. I was right on the edge of being too aggressive. But I found the balance, and it wasn't, it wasn't too much. It was almost too much. And that made it pretty much perfect. I had kind of the same attitude in 2002. I said, I'm, I got one gold already. I'm not going for silver today. I'm going for gold. I took a little more speed. I was a little more aggressive on takeoff than normal. And it was too big. And I crashed. And I got 12th. So you don't have a lot of chances. That was four years later. I had to wait another four years to have another chance. By that time, I was kind of tired of working out so often and not as motivated, not as, not training as much. Older, I was 36. So I didn't have a, a great shot in 2006 either. Uh, but yeah, finding the balance is what it's all about. 
you got to try to be relaxed and go for it a little bit, but you also have to remember certain keywords, you know, like flex your quads, look at the end of the jump, drop your arms fast, whatever that is for each athlete. You got to think a little, but not think too much. As you're coming from a career where you get those finite number of chances, I think, first of all, I'd like to point out that the invisible part of the greatness of a career like the one you've had is all of the workout stuff, all of the preparation stuff, all of the sacrifice that goes into a very finite number of moments where you get to let the rubber meet the road, like you described. And when you are willing to say, I'm going to find where the edge is, that I think, if I can speak for our listeners, is the most inspiring part of the part that we get to see of your career. And the ability for a guy who has broken his collarbone in six places to go, you know what? I'm going to hit this one a little faster. I'm going to hit that ramp a little harder. I'm going to be a little more aggressive so that you can see where the edge is. That's the remarkable part that I think we can all be inspired by. And the spirit of a guy who can face a challenge after being uh, you know, injured and coming back from that injury and deciding that, you know what, that hurt. And I'm going to make sure that I make this count and I don't want to settle for silver and not settling for silver may land you in 12th, but it may land you with uh, with a championship. So we applaud that part of you as your career begins to slow down, as you begin to age and your body gives you back a little less. How do you identify that it's time to um, in a sport that's as extreme as yours and as dangerous as yours? How do you identify that it's time to maybe take a role in coaching and and hang up the skis? Well, I don't really agree with people saying that they want to quit at the top of their game. It's cool if you can do that. But I was so obsessed with the sport. I was such a super fan and I thought it was the coolest thing ever that I wanted to do it for as long as possible. All right. And that, that doesn't include quitting at the top of my game. Quitting at the top of my game would be to try to impress people or it wouldn't be because I love the sport. And so that was never my goal. In hindsight, maybe it could have been, but I did eventually get tired of all of the training and working out and stuff around 2004 Two years before I retired, I probably should have quit in 2004 when I was 34 because I was tired of tired of working out, didn't work enough on the boring things while I was jumping, while I was training in the summertime. I had an issue with leaning to the left that would come back every few years and I'd have to work on it a ton and it was slow going and boring. And so I kind of neglected that a little bit. But my point is it wasn't my body or my age at 36 that made me retire. It was my mind and my motivation was uh, lacking after 18, 19, uh, 20 years, if you count some of the jumps I did here in Montana. After all that time, I wasn't as excited every day to come out and give it my all. And that was the one thing, more than anything, that affected uh, the decline in my results. Uh, it wasn't my age. I could have, I was as strong as I'd ever been when I was 36 or could have been and uh, mentally prepared, just uh, not motivated enough to put in all the hours every day leading up to it. Bergy, I could not have hoped for a, a better, more honest, more sincere answer than that. And I really appreciate that answer because it tells us that you know, it's great to have all the glory answers and say, yeah, I wanted to go out on top and all that stuff. But, you know, for most of us, there is a, a constant quest. If your quest is sincere, there's a constant quest that says maybe that wasn't the top. Maybe there's another thing and maybe there's more. And let's see. And I'm going to turn my body in having put as many miles on it as I can in the quest for this thing. And man, I really applaud that answer. It's Almost like I heard Floyd Mayweather. They asked him if he was really, really, really done. And he said, yeah, I'm really, really, really done. And they said, well, uh, you don't think you've got two or three more fights in you? And he said, yeah, I do. I have two or three more fights in me. What I don't have is the desire to come back to one more training camp. Yeah. 
and I think that that that's you know that's it that's what we all should be striving for it's great if a guy can go out on top and win that one last championship and walk away from the sport that way but really what we're talking about in the most dignified uh quest for you know what it really means to be a champion if if you're asking me and i and i think i speak for pete here too is the ability to try and muster one more and at the point where you decide that you can't you know, you, you don't have the desire in you left. I, I don't think there's any less. In fact, I think there's much more dignity in giving those last efforts and allowing your, um, you know, allowing your quest to, to dictate for you when it is, not for when the last championship happens. Yeah, it's a it's a lot of preparation. You know, people think, oh, why don't why don't you just go to one more games? You know, but it's uh, you know five days a week hours and hours of um, jumping and working out and watching, watching video and visualizing and meeting with coaches and watching nutrition and doing, a, a, you know, aerobic exercise and all kinds of stuff. I just had a, um, a PBS Montana is doing a story on me and they kept saying over and over again, yeah, well, just give us your tapes. We'll, we'll digitize everything and you'll have it all on, you know, digitized. And I'm like, I don't know if you realize how many tapes there are. <laughs> like we, we video all of our training jumps for the most part and I've saved all of mine and it's over 10,000 jumps easily over 10,000 and wow. <laughs> after they got the tapes they they wrote me back and they're like uh well this is a lot of tapes we were gonna have it's gonna take some time and we're not sure we're gonna get them all digitized and I'm like I tried to tell you it's a lot of jumping I wanted to ask you about the edge again because now, I mean, now you're in the coaching side of things when you're talking to one of the people, you know, your, your, your young guys, can someone who's 15 understand where the edge is? Or is there there's just so much, uh, so many other things to work up to, to where you can even discern when you, when you find it? How do you relay that, you know, from your pinnacle moment where you've nailed it and then when you've overdone it, when you've underdone it, you know, you know all the different sides. How do you explain that to someone who's 15 or what sage advice do you give to that 25-year-old dude that's ready to do it? Well, with the young kids, uh, it's the same kind of thing. They're trying to be as big as they can or, you know, go as high as they can without going too high. Uh, They're just doing maybe a single flip with zero twists, you know, or maybe a a double flip with one twist. And those are very, very basic um, moves, basic tricks. So it starts right away from their first jumps on snow. Uh, We try to get them to take the right speed on the in run. We can start anywhere we want on the in run. And we have to, the coach helps a lot, but we have to judge the in run speed. So if the in run, if, if you were slow on your last jump and you got to step up on the next jump, but the sun went behind the clouds. So the in run is, has sped up. So you don't have to step up as much, or maybe you have a tailwind. So you don't have to step up as much, or maybe the tailwind shifts to a headwind. So there's, it's pretty complicated to try to figure out where exactly to start on the in run. And we, you know, we rarely get it perfect right on, and that starts at a young age. The the kids just doing single flips without any twists. They're trying to go fast enough so they don't have to break form, but not too fast that they're gonna you know do one and a quarter flips and and drag their back. Yeah, that's that's the kind of detail that comes with uh, t- having to learn something over ten years to get it right. It takes a certain kind of person, not only to do our sport, but within our sport. There's plenty of people that have done our sport that I would consider kind of not fearless, not uh, aggressive, not appropriate to, to be doing our sport, but they, they jump for years and they do okay. What we're looking for is the kind of person that just decides they're going to win. It doesn't matter what they're jumping like, what their habits are, what the weather is like, what other people are doing. They believe they can and will win. And those type of people will ignore the last crash and ignore that they were too fast a week ago and just choose mind over matter and make it happen. And that's, you know, that's the kind of person that we're looking for. And those are the kind of people that that do well in our sport, the ones that can 
forget about the, the bad jumps and remember the good ones and believe in the impossible. All right. So the guys you talk about who do okay, that's an athlete. The guys that you're talking about who do like you, that's a gold medalist. And that's the difference. And that's why we're talking today to Eric Burgess. Bergie, thank you so much, man. This this has been great. I, I've, I've always been a fan of you since since Nagano uh, as an athlete. Now and, and now I have to say I'm even more a fan of, of Bergie the human being and, and Bergie the champion. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks. Everybody go check out uh, Eric Burgess' website. Airbergie.com. You're always welcome here. Anytime you want a microphone, we'll hand ours over to you and listen to what you have to say. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. Eric Burgess, everybody.